Joining me now is John Perkins. He is the author of The Confessions of an Economic Hitman and now The New Confessions of an Economic Hitman. That came out actually in 2016. John, great to have you on the show. As we talked about last time you were on Aggressive Progressive, I read the original Confessions of an Economic Hitman and so did a lot of people. Because it spent 73 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. And I'm fascinated by uh, what's in the new book, but for the folks who don't know about the, the original book, I wanna go back and tell that story a little bit to catch them up. So uh, what was your job when you were interacting with other countries in the world? Uh, and, and what did it lead you to realize about how the United States and, and neoliberal organizations conduct policy throughout the world? Well, uh, thanks, Jake. My, my job, the job of the economic hitman is basically to identify countries with resources our corporations covet, like oil, for example, and then arrange huge loans to that country from the World Bank or one of its sister organizations. But the money doesn't actually go to the country. Instead, it goes to our own corporations to build big infrastructure projects in the country, things like power plants and industrial parts and parks and highways and ports and so forth. And in the end, the country really suffers for this because money that was supposed to pay for education, health care and other social services goes to pay off the interest on the loans. In the end, the loans aren't paid off at all. Uh, and so we go back, usually under the guise of the IMF, International Monetary Fund, and say we'll restructure the loans, but that requires some conditionalities that the country has to privatize many of its public sector businesses, its utilities, its water and sewage systems, sell them to our investors cheap, uh, or nationalize some of its resources, or vote with us on the next United Nations vote against Cuba or some such thing, or allow us to build military bases on your soil. So there's really this, this incredible hit, this, this payoff. And I have to say that in the cases where we fail, which isn't too often, but I did fail with a couple of presidents, um, the people we call jackals step in. And these are CIA authorized uh, hit people. They're, they're the real kind of hit people, you know. And uh, they'll either throw, overthrow governments or assassinate their leaders. That happened to two of my clients, the democratically elected president of Ecuador, Jaime Roldos, and uh, uh, the head of state of Panama, Omar Torrijos. And as to what I learned from all this, I learned, for example, that I think the United States has made a huge mistake to do this. At the end of the, uh, the Cold War, the, when, when Russia, when the Soviet Union ceased to exist in 1991, we had an incredible opportunity to show the world the benefits of capitalism and democracy. But instead, we, we did things like what I just described. We set out to really, really um, exploit resources in many of these other countries. And so today we're finding that China is making huge inroads into these countries because it, it, required, it, it, it developed a lot of resentment on the part of the people in these countries. So John, um, what was your literal job at the time when you found out? Because you obviously turned on them, you wrote this book to let people know uh, what's happening. Uh, but what was the company you were working for and, and uh, what was the reason that you were even talking to those heads of state within that context? And so I worked for a company called Charles T. Main, which has since been bought out and changed its name. I was a chief economist. I had a staff of highly skilled economists, financial analysts, sociologists working for me. So that was my cover basically. And what would happen is the World Bank or the, the US State Department or the Treasury Department or USAID would hire my company, not me personally, but they would, they would have a contract with my company to go to one of these countries and come up with a plan as to how the country could best use let's say a billion dollars or, or more that, that, the, that the World Bank was prepared to loan to this country. And then it was my job to, to look at what, what ways we could best serve uh, American interests in those countries and convince the president or the finance minister, whoever, uh, that it was to his benefit to make this happen. And, and actually, you know, what happened was a few wealthy people really got more wealthy in those countries. They did very well because they owned the industries uh, that were supported by these infrastructure projects. 
but the majority of the people really suffered. Do you think the folks that worked the World Bank, IMF, etc., had bad intent, or do they get uh, caught up in this game and that genuinely believe that they're trying to help the people of those countries, etc.? And and who does have bad intent? I mean, is it just a core group of people, and and how does that process work? Well, I have to say that there's a lot of really good people, conscientious people, people with consciences working for the World Bank and those organizations. And and I'll have to say that for the first years I was in that job, I thought I was doing the right thing because business school teaches us and the World Bank promotes the idea that if you wanna help a poor country, invest billions of dollars into infrastructure. And in fact, all the economic models show that that happens. Uh, when, when you invest that money, the the economy, the GDP of the country increases. Uh, and so it looks very good. But what those statistics don't show is that they're highly skewed in favor of the very wealthy people. So if you have a country where there's a few wealthy families and they're doing very, very well because you, they're able to use this infrastructure uh, and, and everybody else is doing poorly, it'll still look good. You know, right now we know that three individuals have as much wealth in the United States as half the US population. If those three people are doing really well, and that other half of the population is staying equal or maybe even declining a little bit, the st statistics can still show that they're doing well. And so I began to see this, and I think I was in a unique position because I'd been in the Peace Corps before this in Ecuador for three years, and I, I saw the other side, and I speak Spanish so I could talk to people. So I really began to see how, how wrong the system is. An awful lot of people get stuck in the system, they continue to think that they're doing the right thing. Now, people at the very top, have to understand what's going on, and certainly some of the people in the corporations do. But for the most part, it's a, it's a very uh, subversive uh, system where it's, it's so easy uh, to convince ourselves that we're doing a good job by making these loans, which are really very detrimental to the majority of people in these countries. Well, there's a good example of that uh, here in America. So our GDP has gone up over the last 30 years, but a new economic report came out recently showing that the top 1% their wealth went up by $21 trillion in those 30 years. But the bottom 50%, their wealth went down by $900 billion. So overall, you say, hey, we added $20 trillion to the economy. But what it doesn't tell you is actually half the country suffered and went backwards, and only the top 1% gained. So, uh, so it's not just Latin American countries that this happens in or developing countries. But I, I wanna get back to the silver or lead and, and who knows that. So that's the old Pablo Escobar thing. Look, I can give you a good amount of money or I can call in the jackals and that's what you exposed in the book. Um, so somebody's gotta know about the jackals cuz somebody's sending them in. And my sense of having not just read your book but others was that in the old day there was this basically rich boys club. and. They all went to Harvard and Yale, they did skull and bones. So it was real back in the day, right? To get him tapped on the shoulder, etc. And half of them would go work at oil companies and banks and half of them would go work at the CIA. And it was a, a small click and a couple of guys knew about it. One, is that a fair assessment of the past before we go to how it is today? Yes, I think it, it is and you know, a, a good example is in 2009, uh, Basically, the United States, the CIA, overthrew the president of Honduras, uh, President Zelaya. Now there was local movement too, but it, but it was kind of a classic CIA operation, and it was done because Zelaya had threatened or was actually increasing the minimum wage by sixty percent, and also instituting land reform, which was very detrimental to Dole and Chiquita and many other U.S. companies, and so. <clears throat> We, you know, they wanted to get rid of him. Economic hitmen went in, they were unsuccessful, so he was overthrown. But in the process, the American press and people in high places and corporations could justify all this because Zelaya was accused of being a socialist, of siding with Castro, on and on and on. In fact, none of that was really true. I mean, he, he, he was willing to talk to Castro as most Latin American leaders are. Uh, but he was not a socialist in, in the strictest terms of words. He was certainly not a communist. Uh, he was trying to do a good job for his people. But in the process, our big corporations were suffering. And so the decision was made to overthrow him. Many of the people involved in overthrowing him went in believing that he was a socialist or that he was bad for the country, that he was a dictator. In fact, 
When after he was overthrown, the country since then, Honduras, has had many terrible, brutal dictators. And is now considered to be one of the most dangerous countries in the world outside of actual war zones. So John, this gets us to the new confessions of an economic hitman. So you know, if you read stories about Alan Dulles and how he ran the CIA, you know, his brother became Secretary of State, but they both ran companies that directly benefited from the CIA doing basically coups against some of these leaders. And if they didn't directly benefit, their clients at the bank that they served, etc., or people they knew, their friends, their colleagues, their immediate circle benefited. Uh, from overthrowing those governments and doing exactly what you lay out. So that's a really clear line and it's very easy to see. These days, it's not quite that way. It's not the old club like they had back in the day. Skull and bones doesn't really mean what it used to uh, back in the day. So how does it work today and why are they still doing it? Why doesn't the government look out for the American people instead of American corporations? Well. I'm not sure the government is looking out for the American people. They're still looking out big time for, for US corporations. Uh, yeah, I know, I'm saying why. In the old days, it's because Alan Dulles and his buddies ran the corporation. So it was super easy to understand, right? But now, why is it still the same way? Well, it, I th- a lot of it goes back to the, the idea that was really promoted in 1976 by Milton Friedman, an economist from the Chicago School who won the Nobel Prize. And one of the most important and insidious things that he maintained was that the only responsibility of of business is to maximize short term profits regardless of the social and environmental costs. And the the job of the US government was to make sure that businesses had the opportunity to do that. And so we've been working under that assumption for a very long time. So every major corporate executive basically believes that he is supposed to, he has to in fact, do whatever he can to maximize his profits, including uh, ripping off other countries, uh, destroying the resources upon which his business depends, uh, corrupting. Uh, officials. In the United States, we corrupt officials legally through the campaign process and through offering uh, people in high places very lucrative consulting and uh, lobbying jobs once they get out of those high places. So there's this whole system in place that revolves around maximizing profits and stealing resources, basically doing whatever you have to to get resources cheap, as cheap as, as cheap as you can from whatever country. And today, this is complicated by the rise of the Chinese. So today we have two superpowers once again, as we did during the Cold War. Uh, and so we're seeing a tremendous uh, drive to beat up the hearts and minds of people in Latin America and Africa, as, as opposed to letting China beat up the hearts and minds of these people and to take their resources. So. Um- in the old days, it was a literal group of a small number of men who ran these companies and ran the government. And they did it for their own benefit and lied about how it was for the benefit of democracy. These days, since the corruption that affects those developing countries starts in America, and the corporations have bought off the government officials through campaign contributions, is the heart of corruption actually right here in America? There's corruption, <laughs> there's corruption all the way along the line, but yeah, we 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 generate it, and you know, people will say, well, the government of of such and such a country is terribly corrupt, but you got to ask yourself, who's corrupting them? You know, corruption doesn't just grow on trees. Uh, some somebody's doing the corrupting, and it's very interesting that you know sometimes when you go to places like I, I was recently in in a, in a country where you know I, I to get through the security <laughs> to get on my airplane I had to basically uh, let the security guard take a flashlight that he that he wanted and it was obvious. Or sometimes we have to give money to people like that to uh, to get a piece of paper signed. Um, and we see that as this deep, deep corruption. In the United States, we don't generally have to do that. We don't have to do that. But we have corruption on this extremely high level, and it's legal. So I suppose, it, quite strictly speaking, it isn't corruption. But when you are able uh, to, when, when a corporate executive, a CEO of a big corporation, basically has a lot more votes than you or I have, not personally, but through campaign financing, he gets to win over. Uh, recent studies show that the average senator uh, can be bought 
for less than fifty thousand dollars. And many companies may, may may buy that senator for that amount, but he, he he's going to defend all of them. A House of Representative uh, person is even less. Uh, but you and I aren't likely to do that. And so these these senators and, and House of Representative people will really represent these these big corporations. And the other thing is that the corporations will promise them, well, you know, if you don't win the election or when you decide to drop out of politics, uh, we'll give you a really good job as a as a lobbyist or a consultant with our corporation. We'll pay you a lot of money every year, but just defend uh, us while you're in that position. All right, John, there's so much to talk about. We'll have to have you back because we're way out of time. Uh, but everybody check out uh, the new Confessions of an Economic Hitman as well as all of John's books. Thank you so much for joining us on the Arctics, appreciate it. My pleasure, keep up your great work. <laughs> I appreciate what you're doing, thank you. After the coup in Niger, the BBC said there are concerns Niger could move away from its Western allies and closer to Russia like its neighbors Burkina Faso and Mali, who've both pivoted to Moscow since recent military coups of their own. No, you, you mean that they're sick of France occupying them and they want their country back. There, I fixed it for you. See, Niger is a country famous for its uranium. When we talk about neo-colonialism, this is one of the best examples. The French are heavily dependent on nuclear energy, and one-third of French homes are powered by uranium that comes from Niger, the Eiffel Tower even. Meanwhile in Niger, 80% of the population do not even have electricity. France needs Niger's uranium so much, and yet Niger is the second poorest country in the world. How is this possible? Because the French are robbing them blind, taking and giving pennies. French neo-colonialism. So do not be surprised when people in Niger are chanting à bas la France, down with France, and flying Russian flags. African countries are sick of being robbed. They are being independent. They are choosing to pivot away from Western colonizers. Whereas we in Britain, in France, in Europe, we have a history of lying, cheating, and stealing. That is our legacy in Africa. And yet the BBC and CNN, they want you to think that Russia and China are debt trapping Africa, like as if we didn't. They speak about African leaders as if they are children, as if they are stupid, like they don't understand what's good for them. Oh, they need the white man. They need Western troops and Western corporations to come and save them. <laughs> really? Yeah, I've seen this film before. People are so desperate to run away from the wars, from the plundering that we have inflicted on Arabia, on Africa. They are risking their lives. They risk perishing in the Mediterranean Sea, in the English Channel. But apparently they're the invaders. <laughs> you see Mali, you see Central African Republic, Sudan, and others that are they're soliciting Wagner services because France and the U.S., can't get the job done. France and the US come put their military bases in Niger and Burkina Faso and Mali and they say, we're here to save you from ISIS. Who created ISIS? Who created Al Qaeda and unleashed them on the Middle East and on the Sahel? CIA and NATO. There was no ISIS before we destroyed Iraq, before we destroyed Syria, before we destroyed Libya. That wasn't a thing. This is why people are flying Russian flags when they have a coup in Niger. They are rejecting a president who is pro-French and pro-American. They are rejecting neo-colonial shackles and the West. And then, of course, they're going to go look elsewhere. They will look towards Russia and China, towards the competitors who treat them as equals. It's not that difficult to understand. again for inviting me. I thought they never would after the last bad thing that I said. I must have upset lots of people, I'm sure. Every time I make a presentation, I upset lots of people, but never the critical collective, so we must be thinking alike. <laughs> uh, 
I congratulate them, really. Uh, it's amazing to see so many people here. Uh, and I also congratulate scholars uh, for linking again with Critical Collective. It's been some time. And I hope this partnership continues and flourishes because this is just amazing to see the number of people. I, I have to apologize for two things. The first is, uh, I have to apologize in advance. I'm not an expert on Africa. Uh, what I'm going to offer you, perhaps it's not enough, but it's some commonsensical observations. Uh, I hope it's common sense. Uh, but uh, sometimes it's better not to be an expert, you know, to be able to see things from uh, slightly afar. The second thing is, I'm wearing the wrong trousers. <laughs> I was fixing my bike, so I wore my old trousers. And so please don't video this part, because my wife will immediately divorce me. <laughs> um, okay, so... What I'm going to try and do is uh, just give you some <coughs> charts and a couple of tables just to paint a little bit of a picture that you already know. Okay, so what this presentation is fundamentally designed to say is this. Africa historically, Sub-Saharan Africa, has been fundamental to the global prosperity of the advanced countries, okay? And Africa had a role to play. It has a role as a raw material producer. We will not allow Sub-Saharan Africa to escape that, okay? We do everything to keep Sub-Saharan Africa where it is, also impoverished. It's absolutely vital for the prosperity of everyone else. So let's get clear about that, okay? And this means all the economic structures, all the global institutions, and the economics we teach everyone is all designed to keep Africa exactly where it is. And whether it is Europe or US or now China, it's always the same. We need Africa to be impoverished because we need those raw materials and we need them dirt cheap. Okay, so that's the message. It doesn't mean to say that there's nothing Africans can do. Of course there is. Okay? But this is the opposition that they're fighting. This is what it's about. Because if Africa does do something different, I assure you living standards of all those in Europe and North America and Asia is going to fall. Okay? And that is a big price to pay. I assure you that the West is not going to allow that without a big fight. Okay, so this is what it's fundamentally about. Uh, what I want to show you is how these structures are operating. It's just 20 minutes, so we can't do very much, but just to give you a little bit of an idea. And why I keep the ideology part there is because we are part of the producers of ideology. At universities and academic institutions, we are complicit in this whole enterprise. Okay, so the job of many Western academics is to convince Africans they have to keep doing what they're doing. Okay, and to show them it's your fault that you're poor. It's not our fault. It's your fault that you're poor. You know, so this is what we do in academic institutions, and I, I want to show that as well. We just start. This is what it's basically about, so you, you know what it's about. But I want to just show you the extent to which Africa is specializing in the production of raw materials and basic agricultural goods. Um, we know the basic forces that have caused this underdevelopment. We know it's colonization. I will not discuss that very much because my colleague speaker is going to go into some aspects of this. But I do want to discuss the global economic <coughs> structures, the global financial institutions, and economic ideology, briefly, to give you a flavor of those. Let me start with this. You can't really see it so easily, but if those of you who are interested, you want the PowerPoint, I'm sure we can make it available to you. Uh, but the thing that you really need to see is the top line. Okay, 
And the extent of dependency is captured by this statistic at the top. Okay? And you compare it with all other income groups, and what you see is essentially in that one statistic how dependent sub-Saharan Africa is on raw material production. Okay? This is the very heart of what makes sub-Saharan Africa beat. Okay? Here, just to have a look at one very important additional statistic with all this export coming from sub-Saharan Africa, how much does sub-Saharan Africa account for in terms of global trade value? value. We know there are vast resources coming from there, but look at the bottom line in terms of global trade value. Look at that. 0.5% 1975, 0.95% going down to 0.1. To 0.1. Meaning that with all these vast resources being produced, how much are they getting for it? Nothing. Nothing. This is a very significant piece of data. Then I just want to show you what has happened to sub-Saharan Africa because what we know, what we know and from all studies, no country ever develops without manufacturing. Okay, producing raw materials will not take you anywhere. Producing basic agricultural goods will not take you anywhere. And let's have a look at how much manufacturing activity takes place in sub-Saharan Africa. We can look over the last 15 odd years, 15, 20 years. And we see manufacturing has actually declined as a percentage of the total. This is percentages of total production in sub-Saharan Africa. How much of it is accounted for by manufacturing? So this figure here is 17% of the total. Most of the rest, when we talk of industry, it includes manufacturing, but the bulk of it is mining. Okay? Raw material extraction. This is the bulk of it. And here we, we see actually raw material extraction has stayed the same, what has caused industry to fall is the fall in manufacturing production. This is deliberate because we will never, as Western economists, as Western policymakers, we cannot afford to allow Africa to industrialize and start producing manufacturers. Okay, so we will do everything to stop that. And I'm going to show you how we actually block that. It's obvious in certain ways, but it's less obvious in other ways. Now, we have actually seen periods of rapid growth in sub-Saharan Africa, misleading people, saying, oh, you know, we're now doing much better. And this has happened recently. Recently, I've had students come and tell me, we've done much better now. And you can see growth rates rose quite sharply in recent times. Now are starting to go again down. But if you look historically, the same thing happened earlier. Why? Because in these two periods, we had East Asian rapid industrialization processes. So in the earlier period, we had Japan and Korea and Taiwan. Okay, rapid growth, sucking in raw materials from Africa, driving up the prices, and then sub-Saharan African countries grew. Exporting raw materials, they grew. But after those countries finished industrialization, then sub-Saharan African growth rate again fell. Okay, but along comes China. Next wave. Okay, again, sub-Saharan African growth rises, but now China is going down. As many of you now know from the press, China is going down. But sub-Saharan Africa is going down even faster. And we're going to go back to where we were again 
with very low prices of raw materials, very low growth rates, and again, the sorts of poverty that we saw once before. Because, uh, bottom line, Sub-Saharan Africa is condemned to this role, just the supplier of raw materials, not a manufacturer. Very recent data showing <laughs> emerging markets that produce raw materials against emerging markets that produce manufacturers. And you can see now with the weakness in the global economy, it's the emerging markets, that's the red line, it's those countries that are suffering the most, the emerging markets producing raw materials. They're suffering the most. And here it translates into their currencies being butchered. Okay? The currencies are collapsing of these countries, and many of them are sub-Saharan African countries. Some of them are Latin American countries, okay, who also rode that same wave. They thought that raw material production was going to save them. But now they're facing terrible problems. And I'm sorry to say it's just going to get worse in the next two years. It's not going to get any better. And this is, was it. This is what it does in terms of gross domestic product. It's the blue line you should look at. It's the blue line compared with the red line. And what we know is that blue line is really going to go down sharply in the next two years. Okay, so relative to the rest of the world, Sub-Saharan Africa is going to suffer. Again, why? because it's condemned to this raw material production. This is basically why. How is it condemned to that? Well, the first, the first and most important is the economic structures. After colonization ended, we needed new structures to keep these countries where they were. Okay? And the first of those is aid. Okay, we give them aid. Aid for what? Actually, we give them aid to keep repressive regimes in power. That's all. Okay, we're not giving them aid for much more except a little bit of infrastructure to make sure those raw materials get to the ports and aren't gotten out of the ground. But for the most part, we give repressive regimes money and power and guns to keep that system going. This is what it's fundamentally about. All the hypocrisy about transparency and democracy and bullshit like that, it's all bullshit. You know? And at least the Chinese don't enter into that bullshit. They say, we don't care about the whole political environment, we just give the money. Okay? And it's for raw material extraction. Period. Okay? Number two, and this was a very important one, still is debt. I was telling some of my students today, was it today or yesterday, about Confessions of an Economic Hitman. You remember this? Has, have any of you heard of this one? Confessions of an Economic Hitman. It's a book written by John Perkins, who used to work for a very nebulous opaque bank. No one had ever heard of this bank, but it was formed in the 1950s by the IMF, the CIA, and the American State Department. And it had only one job, to lend money to developing countries that were raw material producers, in order to indebt them. Once you are in my debt, I control you. Okay? And this bank had 4,000 employees, but no one ever heard of this bank, you see. But it would go to country after country, offering loans. And if the president did not accept the loan, they were killed. And he gives two examples of presidents who were killed when they did not accept the loan. You see, the lending is also very important to trap the country. It's very important. It's part of that process. I teach in Suriname. 
And Suriname in recent times had a huge foreign exchange reserve, so big they didn't need to borrow money. And then one of my students who was very high up in government, he said, you know, the IMF is trying to convince us to borrow money from foreigners. Why? I thought, duh, you know, sorry about this, but, you know, this is the game. And in the end, Suriname did borrow this money because the IMF said, if foreigners lend to you, then everyone will think Suriname is such a strong economy that foreigners are interested in lending to you. You understand? Before Lula came to power, you know, the previous president in Brazil, Cardoso, his predecessor, took a gigantic international loan. No necessity for taking the loan. Why? Because once I catch you with the debt strings, I hold you forever. You are my prisoner. Okay, so debt has been this huge spider's web which has trapped sub-Saharan Africa and keeps them held there. Aid, debt. We have a third structure which is again not known by many people, but it's something that was put in place and continues to this very day. With no one discussing it, no one says anything about it, it is monopoly buying structures. This is for all raw materials and basic agricultural goods produced by developing countries. There are only four or five Western multinationals that buy all those goods. And they collude between them. So if you take any major product, these Western multinationals, they collude between them. Even if we go down to banana production, we had a PhD down here at the ISS, and the person showed that the four or five major multinationals they collude, and in order to make sure their control is total, what they do is they force all the producers to pr produce the same uniform banana. You know, the crap you buy in the West and has no taste at all? You go to any developing country, you know how a banana tastes, don't you? There's so many of them, lots of varieties, but we only market one or two types, so we have control, you see. If you don't produce at the price I want you to produce, I go to the next country. You see? We get control. So these buyers, they impose that control. And they keep pushing the prices down and down and down. Okay? This is the game. No one says anything about it. There are no commissions of inquiry to say, this is illegal what you're doing. The WTO has nothing to say about this. But sorry to say, you know, if banana prices rose ten times, especially for people like me who love bananas, okay, I protest. I like my living standards. Okay, it's the same with all the other raw materials, you see. We're all benefiting. We're complicit. We're actually complicit in this because we will protest and shout out if the situation ever changed. <coughs> Okay, now we come to those international institutions. And I must tell you this, from the outset, don't think of them as wicked. IMF, World Bank, WTO. We always think evil creatures. Horrible. It's not. It's just economics. It's economic warfare. The rich declare war on the poor. It happens everywhere. It happens in a country. The rich control the government. Of course they do. You really believe you have democracy? Come on. You know, I mean, grow up. This is not about people living in democratic systems. What we have is the rich control. The rich set up these institutions explicitly to control the poor countries. And they don't give them much room for maneuver. Which, incidentally, when the IMF starts talking of poverty alleviation, you should also understand that there's another game there also starting to play, which I'm going to come back to later. But what do these institutions do? What does the IMF do? What is structural adjustment about? It's about making sure countries keep producing what we want them to produce. We make sure they have recurrent balance of payments problems. You notice 
These countries never get out of balance of payments problems. You notice that? Whereas countries that never took IMF support are always out of balance of payments problems. But the countries that are continuously getting advice and support by the IMF, they're always in balance of payments problems. Why? Because that's the way we keep our stranglehold on them. And that's what we have done. We have done, the IMF and the World Bank. And they've also done something very, very important. And that is they have destroyed the self-sufficiency of these countries. Colonization started it. Okay? One of the most important things is we destroy food self-sufficiency. Okay? And the World Bank continued it. They forced most countries to eliminate all food subsidies and food support. Okay? Because once you don't produce your own food, I increase my control of it. How do we know this? Well, very funny thing happened some years ago. Not so funny, actually. It involved starvation of a large number of people in Malawi. Okay? Many of you could remember this because it was really tragic. But the Malawian finance minister, who was under terrible threat at the time, suddenly broke ranks and he said, well, do you know why we had this famine? Because one of the conditions of the loan given by the World Bank was we destroyed all our grain surplus stocks. Why? Because remember, we want you dependent. 1970s, the U.S. Senate, the U.S. Congress said, we will not allow Latin America to produce their own food. We will start a strategy involving the IMF and the World Bank to destroy food self-sufficiency of Latin America. Then they will indeed be our true backyard. And that's exactly what they've done. Look at all the Latin American countries. Look at them. They used to be food self-sufficient, but they're no longer food self-sufficient. Now, here comes the kicker. This is the beautiful part of it. I'm, I congratulate them. You know I admire them because they do it so well. Okay? I, I know it sounds really perverse, but we have now in the WTO something called the Agreement on Agriculture. Okay? You know what that Agreement on Agriculture states? It says... If you don't have any subsidies, you're not allowed to put these subsidies on food. But if you have subsidies and income support for food production, you can keep them. Who has all the subsidies and income support? U.S., Europe. The largest budgets in the world for supporting their farmers are Europe and U.S. But the World Bank and IMF have destroyed all those subsidies. You see, all those subsidies have been destroyed. And now we're telling these countries, you don't have subsidies, tough luck, you know. You see, we're keeping them dependent. We're keeping them on a string. I have five minutes, so I have to be choosy about what I say next. We have lots of examples in the WTO to really stop Africa industrializing. This is the crucial thing. We cannot allow them to produce manufacturers. It's not difficult. Trust me, it's not difficult. We need nationalist governments. We need them committed to industrialization, and it won't take them a decade to move out from where they are. This is the fundamental point. It's not difficult. But this next round of the WTO is designed to block that. If we had time, I would go through all the different things that they're trying to put into place to block anyone else getting on top of the ladder. You've read this book of Hajun Chang, Kicking Away the Ladder. You see, when we become rich, we make sure the others can't climb up the ladder and join us. Okay? And this is what this next Doha round is about. It's to make sure, especially sub-Saharan African countries, do not escape. Since I have about three minutes left, I'm going to go to this economic ideology thing, because this is important for academics. You see, we teach, in many cases, garbage. And it doesn't hurt anyone, a lot of this garbage. You know, it's a blah, 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 blah. 
And we don't know what we have learned, but anyway, we were there at the university and you got a certificate and you go away and you feel you've learned something. <laughs> but sometimes we teach very destructive things. And no more important than when we're teaching people from developing countries. Okay, and one of those very damaging and destructive things is the doctrine of comparative advantage. It's a lie from beginning to end. It's utter crap. It has been decimated many times, but we keep it in every curriculum. Why? Because it tells sub-Saharan African countries that their destiny is to produce raw materials, you see. And if you produce raw materials, you get rich just like we are in the West. You see, this is the game we're playing. And just for you to be totally confused, we normally build models with it, mathematical models. So you really have no idea what we're talking about. But it seems all very scientific. Then we have the modern version of this is because it's all a failure, we know it's a failure, we now have a new generation of economists saying, ah, oh, it's only a failure because you're all corrupt in your countries. We call that new institutional economics. You've all probably learnt it all, but you didn't know why they invented it. It was invented to tell you the same thing, you should keep producing raw materials, now, don't be as corrupt as you were before. Nobody ever told you that aid was designed to actually start the corruption process in the first place. Okay, and we need corruption to make sure you're doing all these things. But now, we blame the victim. You're poor because it's your fault, basically. And you're poor, stupid, and corrupt, basically. This is the message that we're giving people. We also have many theoretical justifications, but I'm going to say something controversial to end. And she's happy that I'm ending, because she has to discipline me. And that is, there are also what I call more enlightened approaches, but which are also potentially destructive for sub-Saharan African <coughs> development. And this is where I come back to the IMF and the World Bank. You see, now they're all into poverty alleviation. They want you to concentrate on redistributing income. And it's something nice. You're young people, you're socially conscious, you're aware. You don't like all this injustice. So you gravitate towards what we call pro-poor strategies. But actually, I'm sorry to tell you, that is not what Africa needs. Africa needs aggressive industrialization. When China was a communist country and we had equal distribution, who feared China? Who took them seriously? They weren't even the size of the Netherlands. But today, I can't open an internet site. I can't open a magazine. I can't open a newspaper without China, 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 China. And we know what has built China? It's not socialism or communism, it's capitalism, guys. It's manufacturing, it's production. This is what creates employment, this is what creates jobs. So I'm not pro-capitalist, but this is the reality. And unfortunately, we're now going to court, get caught with the good cop, bad cop. The good cop is now IMF saying, oh, you must concentrate on poverty reduction and income redistribution, as long as... We can take you away from industrialization. This is the crucial thing. You know? I leave it at that. And I'm sorry I took so much.